everyone, and welcome back to our Scrabble Spot Said workshop. And I thought I'd show a picture of Strabo over here at the top, a Greek geographer. Um, and he is the one who inspired the name of the program. So to recap what happened yesterday, on Monday, we gave you a brief uh, overview and introduction. We talked about how we use Scrabble Spot as a field notebook, how you would set up projects. For example, on the desktop, you use this little uh, red symbol to start a project how you, we would use the spot concept and how you can use maps, layers, and different tabs. And then of course, I think you're familiar with how you would actually add and modify your data by where this red arrow is here. We also talked about and introduced you to the vocabulary. And these are a lot of the words that we use in our discipline. So for the sedimentology, you wanna have all of these uh, toggles on that help bring up some of these tabs that you see across the top here. And then each of these uh, tabs has got different menus where we have a lot of our vocabulary. And then if you want to plot up a stratigraphic section, you need this strat mode on and you can add a stratigraphic section and view it, et cetera, as the pink arrow shows. Uh, we also talked a little bit about the workflow in developing stratigraphic sections. So once you decide to make a stratigraphic section, you add intervals as shown here. And then this is enlarged over here to the right What's maybe important that I'm not sure that we mentioned is that the lines that are red here, that's where the information is required um, in order to generate uh, the particular um, thing that you're on, or in this case, it would be the stratigraphic interval. So green are optional and red are the things that are actually required. And the, the plastic type is required here in order to generate the, the weathering profile of the stratigraphic column. So here's an example of a stratigraphic column. Um, and some of the things that you can do are you can use spots to actually make some annotations of words. You could also even use the line function to um, try to specify certain intervals if you want to show things like this showing trough cross stratification to planar uh, to ripple lamination. But it's not quite the same as we do our drafting in the regular uh, programs where you you have graphical um, displays of your stratigraphic columns. And then the last thing that we talked about were um, the data sets and how we use some of these different functions to format it or to export or to upload uh, some of our projects. We also assigned a short homework and this was where you were going to try the program and generate a simple vertical point bar section. Um, and this was a classic example shown here on the right. You know, again, we can't put all these symbols in the section yet, but maybe this is something that we can work towards, but you can make notations and you can link photos. And so um, seeing what you actually came up with in the program, uh, maybe you came up with something like this, which would have been a very simple type of example, showing the course lag at the bottom, is some trough, trough cross stratified, rippled heterolithic and mudstone intervals. And we were able to get one uh, participant's um, example, and this was from Brady, and he was willing to share this. So you can see on the right, his is a slightly better example that shows a little bit more of a weathering profile. When you change the weathering profile, this might actually change those, some of the data that's, that's in your, um, your description. So here you can see this has a, a, a nicer weathering kind of profile that seems to match the actual type of thing that we would typically generate for uh, stratigraphic sections. And he's added some notes here. And one of the things that you possibly could do is you could change the um, vertical, excuse me, the horizontal scale. So if I take Brady's section here, I can actually scrunch it together a little bit. When you do that, you scrunch the words together so it's a little bit harder to read, but you could save this as a SVG you could modify it in Adobe Illustrator and you could actually use it as maybe a base layer and make some overlays that you could do your regular graphical uh, annotations on. So today what we're going to do is look at some example data sets and in particular Diane's going to start us off with looking at Cretaceous wave dominated shore face deposits and how you would measure a classic uh, stratigraphic section through some parasequences Basil will go over some of the drawing options that we have available. And then Liz will show examples of some short outcrop sections. And then kind of looking ahead, just so you know, Friday is where we're gonna
try to publish um, and link up some of your data sets in the Google Doc, and then we'll talk about where things are going in the future. I just want to make a comment on that vertical section that, that we showed that Brady had submitted. When you change the profile, and Basil, correct me if I'm wrong here, to show that there's an upward finding trend that does not affect the data that's been input. That's just the graphic display. And the hope is, is that with the newest versions of Strabo as they come out, that we can actually get the data set to reflect those changes that we put on that profile. Is that correct, Basil? That, that is correct, but again, it's in the future, so we don't know, but that is the idea. Okay, great. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do today is, is pick up on what Casey started yesterday. Casey walked us through um, how to use Strabo as a field notebook and then how to construct a vertical section using Strabo, and then you've had a chance to practice on the homework exercise that Marjorie just showed. So hopefully everyone's a little more comfortable with this. What I'm going to do now is take us through a virtual tour of a classic shore face succession in the book lists of Utah. And my screen is not responding. There it goes. Okay, so it's outlined in Utah here in white and Salt Lake City, obviously. And the book cliffs is this trend, this dark trend that we're seeing here. And we're going to, these have great exposures of classic uh, wave dominated shore face successions. And so I just want to keep put your attention on the town of Helper. Just north of Helper, there's a canyon, which we're going to visit in the next half an hour. So just a simple cartoon here that actually shows that these particular deposits are located near the town of Helper again. And so here's the outline of the book cliffs. My cursor up through here, Green River, Utah, a little further to the south. And so during the Cretaceous, these were at the edge of a foreland basin. So here's a severe orogenic belt to the west, and then it transitioned from plastic deposits that were very coarse conglomeratic down to some coastal plain type deposits and then to marine shoreline successions. And here's the larger picture taken from Blakey and again outline of Utah. And so the dark area here represents the Foreland Basin and the rest is the Cretaceous Western Interior Seaway. So it's a wave dominated environment. And so using Strabo we could actually get a close-up view of the canyon itself. So back here again this is Helper where my cursor is. And then these little streets that you can see in the background, this is all part of the town of Helper. So if you came just a little bit further north, um, GW1 is the location. And the red line here represents the path that we're going to follow up this canyon in order to go through the measured section. Okay, so here's a view of Gentile Wash. Um, it, it's a very well-visited locality. It's a classic um, section to looking at, for looking at wave-dominated shore faces as you move up the canyon and river-dominated deltas at the base of the canyon. So this is all part of the Black Hawk Formation. This is a Campanian aged unit, the Upper Cretaceous Succession. There's a number of members within the Black Hawk Formation. We're going to focus on the Spring Canyon member, which we see in the outcrop here. And then the Spring Canyon member is going to be overlain by the Aberdeen member. But again, we're just going to focus on the Spring Canyon member and this interval in particular, which is shown by the red bar. Rather than having everyone hike up to this interval, which is going to be a little dangerous, we're just going to walk up the, the floor of the canyon until the outcrops actually intersect the canyon itself. Okay, so the book list contained classic localities where a number of the concepts of sequence stratigraphy were developed. And outcrops in the Black Hawk Formation are spectacular. They contain unparalleled exposures, which allow for the examination of shore face faces. And the outcrops are important localities for both teaching and research, and they provide an ideal location to field test Strava. Okay, so before we go into any more pictures of the outcrop, I just want to make sure that we're going to use the terms consistently um, when I talk about a wave-dominated shore face. So this is a shallow marine succession that's dominated by wave processes. So um, this solid blue line here just shows the wave height during day-to-day -day conditions, and the broken red line, broken blue line here shows how much larger that wave height is during storm conditions. And so this very um, subdued line here shows a effective wave base or the fair weather wave base in a much more landward position than the storm wave base is here. So during fair weather conditions, only from this point where my cursor is towards the shore, will these sediments be affected by waves? And then during storm conditions, everything this this uh, interval or the location where you can start reworking the sediment shifts seaward and so we'll have bioturbated sediments beyond the storm wave base and then during storms everything gets reworked by hummocky cross stratification which is what the symbol represents and the burrowing 
represents a shift back to fair weather conditions. And then from fair weather wave base landward, as the storm subsides, we're going to rework the sediment into cross bedded units, and then the beach itself, which has the nice seaward inclined parallel to sub parallel lamina. So we're going to call that beach horizon the foreshore. And then we're going to call everything between that beach and where we find our distal most wave base, the storm wave base, the shore face. And everything that's affected by fair weather conditions, we're going to call upper shore face. And that's just going to include these cross bedded horizons, my cursor again. And then as we go a little further down depositional dip, we'll have lower shore face, which is going to be the HCS beds, which are going to be larger as we get closer and closer to the land. And then they'll be smaller because there'll be less wave energy as we go a little bit deeper. And then we'll have offshore, which is just fire to baited sediments in the more distal succession. So we're going to take this succession applying Walther's law. We're just going to start stacking foreshore on top of upper shore face, lower shore face, and so forth. And that's the idea behind um, facies development that we're going to see in these wave dominated shore faces. Okay, so we're back into Gentile Wash. We're going to walk through this exposure. Again, we're going to come up the floor of the canyon. And what we're going to do is we're going to see how Strabo can help collect and organize data from this classic locality. Okay, so we're a little further up the canyon now. We can't see the entrance of the canyon. And the people that are here in the vests, this is the group of sedimentologists that came out with us in the fall to help us field test Strabo. And you can see they're already starting to measure the section, but they started the section and we're gonna start our section out here. So there's a more resistant unit here, which is basically a flooding surface. So that's gonna be the datum. And then we're gonna take this interval and we'll blow it up and we're gonna see that this interval is covered. That's important to include because we don't really know what's underneath a covered interval. So the first thing we're going to do is come to um, our first page. We're going to add a stratigraphic section at the spot, yes. And so we're going to click View Stratigraphic Section. And what it's going to do is it's going to give us this blank screen where we're going to have grain size across the horizontal axis, and then the vertical axis is going to be depth. So then we're going to click the button, as both um, Casey and Margie has told, have told us before. And that's going to allow us to add data. And so we're going to get this screen. And again, um, we've got a bunch of options here. It says insert after. So this basically is the top of the section. So I'm just going to keep adding vertically. If I wanted to interject, I would just click that option and interject between some units that I've already mapped and, and or at least I've already recorded. Okay, and then it's going to auto populate this interval name um, because I'm not going to change this. This is going to be GW2 for Gentile Wash 2. Gentile Wash 1 is just the spot that tells me where my vertical section is. And then notice here, the next option is this interval thickness that's underlined in red. And so that is something that we have to fill in because if we don't have an interval thickness, we can't plot vertically. And then the other one that's outlined in red here is select solicit classic type. And I can change this to um, carbonate or, or, or coal or whatever type of rock category that I have, and that's going to allow us to develop this horizontal axis. Okay, so I'm going to add um, 2.6 meters of, of float to this section, and then I've got that added, and the next thing I would do is I'm going to look at this type of interval. It defaults to bed, but we saw that it's not a bed, it's a covered section. So then if I click the arrow for this, it's going to give me this box, which can show bed, bed with mixed lithologies, Casey went through this yesterday, interbedded and so forth, but this is unexposed or covered. So I'm going to click this and what it's going to do is it's going to give me a screen that only allows me at this point to say the, the interval name, the thickness in meters, and that it's exposed. If I wanted to go into more, I would just click add more detail, but because it's covered, I'm not really going to put anything more here. Okay, and so that's my vertical section at this point. Here's my GW2. Now I'm ready to add a new section or add a new bed or horizon. So I'm going to click the plus button here. And that means I have to go to the outcrop and I have to start collecting my data. So here's our fall trip participants looking at this outcrop. And you can see that this is, you know, pretty busy. It's got a lot of beds, recess intervals, beds, recess intervals, beds, some recess intervals. And we're not at the outcrop, but you can see these nice waveform features coming through here. So this is really low amplitude HCS bedding coming through here. You can see a nice waveform feature coming through here. This is more burrowed interval coming underneath. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to, um, I added my data, or I'm going to add my data. I clicked my plus button here. So now I have to add my interval thickness. And 
then what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to recognize that, okay, I've got 2.2 meters of, of thickness, but it's not a bed. It's basically an inner bedded straight up because if I click bed, then I'm going to have to measure each of those about 15 centimeter thick beds one after another. And if I were measuring this without using this program, I'd lump it together anyway. So I'm going to add 2.2 meters of inner bedded straight up with HCS beds at about 15 um, centimeters thick. And then those recessed burrowed sandstone beds also at about 15 centimeters thick. And so again, I'm going to change from bed to inner bedded. And what that's going to allow me to do is describe lithology one, which is going to be my HCS beds, and then lithology two, which is going to be the burrowed sandstone beds. And when I do that, I now have another step on my vertical section. So I've added this 2.2 meters, and it's giving the thicknesses that I've added. And I'm going to keep going up section. And so then now what I'm finding is that I'm starting to get some nice well-developed HCS bed. So here's a 15 centimeter scale, and you can see the nice aniformal and synformal structures within this HCS bed. So I'm gonna measure these beds. I'm gonna just bed by bed measure and add them to my, my, my stratigraphic section. And if I click on any one of these units, like if I clicked on GW4, Gentile Wash 4, then it's gonna give me a little box that says I've got an interval thickness here of 0.6 meters. Um, the mythology is, is primarily siliciclastic, and it's going to give me a grain size, which in this case I think is fine lower or very fine upper. And then if I wanted to, I could scroll down if this was an active screen through this box to see what else I've added in terms of said structures. And then if I want to add even more, I would just click this and the cursor back again, see more, and I could add more if this was an active screen. Okay, so as I walk up through this section with the metamorphic petrologist for scale, what I'm seeing is that they've got some. HCS beds, and I've got a recess interval here that's going to have the same type of bedding that I showed in that first part of our measured section, and then I'm going to start to get some amalgamated HCS above that. So I want to add that all to my section, and so what I've done though is, is I, I've said that this recessed interval actually looked more like a package of beds to me rather than interbedded because it just had some more bioturbation and less bioturbation, but we had some hummocky to swaley cross stratification in there, so I'm just going to add this my descriptive information. And then again, I'm going to go up and above this section here, which I was able to, to observe more closely without a lot of the float on it. Then I'm going to come back and see this amalgamated HCS. And so I'm going to keep adding sec bed by bed. In this case, the next unit was a 0.8 meter thick HCS bed, plotting my grain size. And so these are just my annotations on the PowerPoint. This is what you're going to see on the vertical section. Okay, so we came through a covered interval, we came through some inner bedded HCS and burrowed sands, and then we've got some HCS beds that are starting to get a little bit thicker. And then the next section that I'm going to find is that I'm going to return back, uh, I'm going to have, this is that thinner inner bedded package. Um, then I have another section here, and this section, which is going to be labeled GW15, looks very much like the section that I saw down here. So as I go back to enter my data, I click my plus, I got my screen, and so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy because I don't want to have to re-describe this. It looks the same to me, and as Casey said yesterday, if we copy and paste, all we have to do is change the interval thickness. And so if I do that, basically I can just click my copy button, and I took this screenshot from a little bit later in the section to show that I would have any of the beds that I've described. I could just click on these, and it'll import this data into my description for this interval here. Okay, and then as I go further up the section, now I'm getting just into the amalgamated HCS beds, which we're seeing here, let's say with GW17. And then sometimes I find some really fun sedimentary structures. So here we've got an HCS bed, the upper portion of which has this beautiful distorted fabric to it. So this is soft sediment deformation. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to add, see more detail in my section. And I'm going to use my horizontal scale and I'm going to get to sedimentary structures. And then I'm going to scroll down. I've gone past the cross bedding. Oops, I've gone back to cross bedding. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for deformation structures and I'm going to click convolute bedding. And so um, we've come now through this HCS dominated strata. Now we're going to jump up to this next interval. And this next, next interval also contains HCS beds and some swaley cross stratification, but it has more biogenic structures. And so I want to show how we're going to add that information. 
So when I so now I'm back on my horizontal menu here, and I've got um, set intervals, set lithologies, set bedding, and then if I click sedimentary structures, then above this, if this was an active screen, I could scroll up, and I'm going to find cross different types of cross bedding and hummocky cross bedding and so forth. But then as I come down through here, I can I can find that okay, I'm quick hummocky cross bedding, and then I jumped ahead, sorry. Then what I'm going to do now is look at my section, and here I've got my bioturbated interval here with this low angle bedding here, most of which is hummocky, and I've got another bioturbated interval here that doesn't have as much bioturbation. So if I want to describe this interval, this burrowed sandstone, again, I have low angle bedding here, and then I've got a, this burrowed sandstone, I want to make sure I capture this. So I'm going to go back to my said structures, and I've just gone through physical where I click the hummocky cross stratification. Now I'm on my bioturbation. I had the option for this bioturbation index. And so if I look at this, I can say, oh, wait a minute, number four here, common bioturbation. Bedding is indistinct because I can see some bedding coming through here, but I can't tell exactly what this is. The burrows overlap. And so I'm going to click that as my option. If I go a little further up the section, I'm going to say, hey, wait a minute, this is a little bit different. I don't want to use my bioturbation index because I can identify particular burrows here. So this is an Ophiomorpha burrow. These are cylindricness burrows. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to said fossils as opposed to said structures. And under said fossils, the upper part of this active screen would show a number of, of um, vertebrate and invertebrate fossils. So now what we're going to do is we're going to come down to where it says traces. And if I select diversity here, then I can say I've got low versus medium versus high diversity. I've got low diversity. Then I have the option of saying, is this a track? Is this a trail? Is this subvertical? Is this branching? And so forth. And I can also talk about the field, whether it's passive field or active field and so forth. But I, and I can give, um, select my behavioral grouping and so forth. But I know the names of these traces. So what I did instead was I just clicked this option and I listed the specific types of traces that I see. So now if I come back to this particular bed and I click on it, I can get my little box that summarizes my interpretations. Here I have amalgamated HCS with Ophiomorpha and cylindricness. And if I scroll down through here, I'd see any more information that I've added about these traces. Okay, so now I'm going to skip and I'm going to go up a little further in the section. And what I have are beautiful cross bed sands, which is what this canyon is known for. And then overlying this, I'm seeing this low angle stratification. And then the other side of the other wall of the canyon, I've got this great cross bedding here, and I've got some seaward inclined parallel to sub parallel lamina. So I'm coming up um, a little higher in my section. So I want to basically describe that cross bedding. And so now I'm going to click the said interval. And now what I want to do is I have to decide is this a bed? Because those are not individual beds. If I were to measure this bed by bed, it would take a long time. Plus, I might get some. Um, abnormal thicknesses or incorrect thicknesses because they're going to thin and thicken laterally. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click here this package or succession of beds and when I do that then it's going to ask me for what's the thickness of the bed. Casey went over this again yesterday. So my interval thickness here is 4.5 meters and I'm going to click package or succession of beds and then if I go ahead I can input that these beds are all about 0.2 meters and so and I clicked that I have trough festoon um, cross bedding within the succession. Okay, and so now that was that cross bedded interval. If I go a little further up the section, I'm going to have seaward inclined parallel to sub parallel lamina, and students obviously measuring section. These are um, point, these are 10 centimeter intervals along the Jacob staff. So what this looks like to me are these nice, again, beach type sediments, the seaward inclined parallel to subparallel lamina. This is a trench through a modern beach horizon. And so as I go up the canyon a little more, this is that same interval, but this same interval here is rooted. It's a little bit easier to see here. And then it's overlain by a coal. And I've got another sand across the top, but, but I want to capture this information. So what I've done is I've broken out. This is my cross bedded interval. This is my seaward inclined parallel to subparallel lamina. And then this is the interval across the top. I put it in as a separate bed because it's rooted. And then I want to add the coal across the top. So I'm going to click. And the reason I'm doing this is, okay, I've got to first put in my required field, which is my thickness of this unit. 
And then what I want to do is I'm going to, this had defaulted to Silica Classic as primary lithology, but it's not, it's a coal. So if I click this interval, I can come down here and I can click organic or coal. And so it's going to add my coal to the succession. And then I thought, okay, well, I'm going from a coal. I know that a coal is a subaerial interval. And so if I've got sediment above it, that means I'm going to have a surface here that I have to pay a little more attention to because I'm basically coming out of my vertical succession and I'm going to start a new succession. So I'm going to put the surface in. And what I did was I went ahead and just used my line tool here and I drew a line across the top. And then after I drew that line, I realized, you know, I probably should have extended it a little bit more to the right and the left. And if I want to do that now, I would just have to come through here with this um, edit tool and I could just click on the end of that line and I could drag that out. Okay, so now I'm coming back to the surface because again, this is a coal, it's a subaerial exposure surface. And then I've got some sands across the top. So I thought in order to bring these sands in, this is gonna be a flooding surface. So I wanna pay a little more attention to the surface and I recognize the surface has relief on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in my notes for the overlying unit, which I'm describing here. And in my notes, I'm going to say that immediately above a flooding surface signifies a deepening event. Then I want to come back here and I want to look at that surface in a little more detail. And I've measured this out and I, I got 0.8 meters of coal coming through here at, at, the, at um, the average thickness. And so I'm going to measure the um, relief on this particular interval that's cutting down into the coal which was once a peat horizon. And so what I'm going to do is I'm coming back to my um, data input. I'm going to click said bedding and I'm going to say, okay, I've got a contact. It's the lower contact and it's going to say it's sharp. Sorry, I jumped ahead and it's well-defined. And then I'm going to put in my notes that I've got tens of centimeters of relief locally. Otherwise, that's a flat surface. Okay, so here I go with my coal and I had my surface that I should have extended out. And then now I've got this unit that sits above it. And a couple things here. First off, I'm coming back into what looks like low angle bedding, then moves up into swaley cross stratification. But I've had so much hummocky to swaley cross stratification before that I want to give this a different name. So now I'm going to deviate from my um, auto populating GW41, GW42, and so forth. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this just lower shore face. I could have called it whatever unit I wanted that overlies this beach horizon, which is my foreshore. And so I'm just adding this to help me when I look at my section. So I'll know that this particular unit is, is a distinct unit and I can recognize that easily. But I've got that surface that I put in and I say it's a flooding surface, but, um, and I've got the relief located here, but I wanted to show this on my vertical section. So now what I'm going to come into, I'm going to alter this section. So I'm going to use my edit tool here and I'm going to come in and I've got to add by just point by point clicking with my cursor, I'm going to bring both my sand and my surface down so that I can show that there's re relief along that particular interval. Now I came back in and I did this later, um, so, so it's not going to show on the rest of my sections. So then overlying that unit, I had some, some low angle stratification, which looked like swaley cross stratification. And then above that, I went into this beautiful cross bedded interval again. This, this is a 15 centimeter Strabo scale. And you can see there's different types of cross bedding through here, different expressions. So here we've got some, looks like some wedge shaped. This is a trough. Um, there's some festoon shapes. Also, this is another trough. And so what I want to do, just another um, picture of the variety of, of of cross bedding here. I don't want to identify these as individual beds because it's going to be hard for me to measure bed by bed through here. So I'm going to call this a package of beds. All has the same grain size, but I can measure the thickness of those individual beds. They're going to average 15 centimeters. They can go up to 20 centimeters in thickness, 15 centimeter scale here. So now when I add this information, I've chosen package of beds. So it's going to ask me what the thickness of this individual bed is. Um, so I'm going to put in here 15 centimeters. Now when I put this in, I got an error because I'm supposed to have this as meter, so then I had to go back and change this to 0.15. Okay, and then I'm going to identify the types of sedimentary structures. I have trough, I have wedge, and I have festoon, which just says that I'm looking at different orientations of these three-dimensional mega ripples as they migrated through the shore face environment. Okay, and then as I looked further, I thought, oh wow, I found this great trace fossil. So here's an escape trace, because you can see the lamina are deflecting downward through here. 
So some organism was living here and then the storm came and it got scared and it ran out as fast as it can. So I wanna add that to my section. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to do see more, to add a little more detail. And then I'm going to collect, I'm gonna click on said fossils again. And then I've come down through here, now I'm under traces. And what I'm gonna do now is, is I know the behavioral grouping of this. So I click on this and I click on escape and then it populates that and that gets added to my notes. Okay, and then above the cross bedded sands, I've got parallel to subparallel lamina, as we saw um, coming up the section underneath the underlying coal. And so this, I'm gonna add in also as, I'm gonna call it parallel to subparallel lamina because I've already had one of these intervals and I wanna distinguish them so that if I'm looking through my section in the field, I don't get confused, rooting across the top, and then I have a really thin coal here, but I don't always see the coal, so I'm gonna add a note in here that says I've got laterally discontinuous coals. And of course, I can photograph this as I've done many times and add that to my section. Okay, so now if I were to just take this and import this into a PowerPoint, I might say, oh, I wanna add in that there's a pair of sequence boundary across the top. I've got a rooted foreshore and a foreshore and upper shore face, but I want this on more than just my PowerPoint. I want this incorporated into my notes. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to my interpretation. So here we've got our Japanese shell profile again with our storm wave base and our fair weather wave base. And we recognize that we've got offshore bioturbated sediments that'll be overlain by Hamiki cross stratified lower shore face and then cross bedded upper shore face and foreshore. And sometimes there's a bar that migrates across the beach uh, the shore face environment. And so when we have that bar in interval, which is present in some sections, we're gonna put in a middle shore face here. So here's my vertical section. And of course, to get it to appear on a screen, it had to be condensed so I can't see the detail. And what I wanna do now is I wanna focus in on the lower part of the section. And so again, this is where we first started measuring our section. And I think I'm gonna lump all of these basically together. I've got a lot of interbedding, maybe some packages, there's the expanded section coming through here, which looks very different than the amalgamated section across the top. So now what I want to do is I'm going to add some detail, but I want to group this first. So I'm going to choose my line spot, and Liz told me to use uh, polygons, and I should have, but I, I was stubborn, so I put my line in because that's what I would have done in my, my notes, and I'm just going to show the progression of adding my lines through here, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click on the last one of my points, and what that does, that forms a new spot. And when I do that, then I get a spot page that appears. And now I can go ahead and add the data to that particular spot, which is grouping that, that group of beds that, that I started at the start of my vertical section. So I'm gonna rename this. I'm gonna call this a um, distal lower shore face because that's gonna be my interpretation. And I can then now go through all of these said structures, diagenesis, said fossils. And if I continue, I can go into more interpretation options, which I'm doing through here. And so I can, decide if I want to put in an energy level. I can put in um, fluidization. I have miscellaneous categories that I can pick and I can add all these. And then, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this a shore face, but I want to be a little more specific. So then under notes here, I'm going to add in that it's a distal lower shore face. And so now um, if I click my back arrow and come back to my vertical section and in my vertical section, I've got a group of beds that I'm going to put together as a new spot. I'm going to call those distal lower shore face. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to work at the next interval. So the next interval was going to be my amalgamated HCS beds, which is what we saw here in the outcrop. I'm going to go through the same process. I'm going to choose my line tool and I'm going to come through here. I'm just going to click and click and click until I define the interval that I want. How far up do I go? Well, I'm going to go back to my section. I'm going to click on my boxes. And so if I clicked on this box that I'm thinking, all right, now I'm starting to get into that burrowed interval that I, I, I separated out earlier. And that's going to be a different sub environment. So I'm going to stop on top of GS or GW36. And when I do that, then I'm going to generate a spot. And then I'm going to get my page here that I can add all my information to. So I'm going to call this basically um, proximal upper shore face, and I can add whatever I want here in terms of my interpretation. Okay, lower shore face, but I'm going to be more specific, proximal lower shore face. And if I wanted to, I could put in tectonic setting and so forth, but for this interval, that, that's not going to be appropriate. So now um, I've got my next section, and I hadn't yet, I had to go back now and change this because I forgot to rename this, my proximal lower shore face. And I'm going to go through the same process through each one of the beds or, or grouping of, of intervals that, that I want to put together. So my 37, 38, this was the er, er, interval that had that bioturbated horizon coming through here. So I'm going to define this as my middle shore face. And then I'm going to come up and I'm going to put 
upper shore face, which is the trough cross bedded interval, and then, oops, went too fast, my foreshore across the top. And um, so as I'm coming up through the section, I just put both views in so we could see the entire section coming through here. Then I've got this horizon across the top, which is coal. And so that coal basically was a raised mire when it was formed. And so I'm going to go ahead and put that in. So now what I have is lower shore face, middle shore face, upper shore face, foreshore, and so forth. So I'm just looking at the Walther's Law application of, of progradation occurring along my depositional profile. But now I want to say, okay, I'm going to package these together because they're genetic related beds and bed sets. So I'm going to add another line tool. I'm going to put another line up through here and I'm going to work my way up through the section. So I'm going to group everything up to the top of my raised mire. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to call that then. It's going to give me a spot that I can go through my interpretations. And I'm going to call this basically a pair sequence because that's how I'm interpreting this. I'm going to call that pair sequence one. And so then I can continue and put the arrow in here to show that in an active screen, I would just continue through here and get into my set interpretations. And so what, I, what else can I say about this? Well, it's coarsening upward. And so I'm going to call this a pair sequence. This is all under architecture. And if I wanted, if I saw a number of these pair sequences stacked, I could call them progradational versus aggradational or retrogradational and then put them in as a systems track, but I haven't gotten far enough yet in my descriptions in order to do that. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to put an interpretation on the surface that overlies this. And so now I'm going to call that surface, um, put some um, emphasis on that surface. And so I'm going to come back here and I'm going to put another surface in here. This is my interpreted surface. And I'm going to call this my, my parasequence boundary one. And I'm going to come through under surfaces and I'm going to just click this interval here, and I realize, oh, I got pair sequence boundary, so I can add this in as a vocabulary word, so I could search later if I wanted for my pair sequence boundaries. And so I'm just going to call that spot name for that new surface that I put in, PSB for pair sequence boundary. And basically, now I've got my section. And so here's where we started. This is Spring Canyon member. This is Aberdeen member across the top. I have two successions. And so these are my two successions here and there. And again, I realized after I did this, and I didn't want to erase it and show you that, that you know, we can all edit this as we go along, I probably should have added, used this key and added a polygon through here. And that was probably a little bit prettier than what I did with my lines. So that's my vertical section through the Spring Canyon member showing you some wave-dominated shore faces. Okay, so... I'm going to quickly go over four different ways that you can sketch in Strabo Spa. We'll have one little sort of interaction at the end. Um, different ways. The first is drawing on paper and uploading them. Um, one is using a very simple sketch tool within Strabo. The third is using a program, an external program, which sounds more complicated than it is. It's really quite quick. And then the third is doing what Diane did basically, which is using the photo um, as an image base map. Um, okay, so option one, if you're really a good artist and you want to do this, um, what structural geologists have least have done is gone to using it on paper and then taking a, a picture of that. You add image, you choose sketch, and you choose okay. So that's a very fast way. I can imagine there are places where you'd want to do that um, in sedimentology as well. So lots of detail. Um, and the, the sketch can even be an image base map. So if you wanted to, for instance, these A, B, and so forth, if you collected samples of particular places, that would be no problem to use this as the image base map to um, locate samples, fossils, whatever you wanted to do in this particular way. The second option is under images. At the very top there you can add an image from file which is how we imported it but there's also this pencil tool that says sketch. If you choose that you will get a blank sheet of paper. it will have only two tools, um, a line tool and an eraser tool, and the eraser is what's circled here. And so I just drew, basically, I drew out this fold below like that, and then just wrote um, what you got. 
So this is just a blank sketch tool. This is for very simple sort of um, note taking, but you can do it. If you had a stylus, like on the new MacBooks, that would be, I would think this would be quite a good option. It would look much more um, professional than my crude drawing. But that's a very simple option. Um, you can also though sketch directly onto a photo. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. You go to your image, images tab. You go to image type, you hit the more button. The more button kicks up image properties and then you use the sketch tool on that. So that's the pencil again. And then I just drew in the, I drew in a bedding plane and then an axial plane on the fold. Um, quite straightforward. Again, it's pretty crude, but it definitely, um, because it's annotating a photo, it's really sufficient for many purposes that you would have. Um, the tool is rudimentary, so I've made some purposeful mistakes to show you that you can't erase a line if you make a mistake um, and so forth. So if you do this, the best option is simply to start over. Um, so it's, again, for very simple tools. The next option is to use an external program. So I'm going to use a program called Skitch. Here it is circled in yellow. It works well on a tablet and it works well for using a finger for drawing. Um, so, and because they both use the camera roll on the iPad, it's easy to share back and forth. So when Strabo takes a picture, the image goes to the camera roll. When Skitch annotates a photo, it goes to the photo roll. So it's easy to import things in and out because of that um, usability. So here's an example where I've gone, I, this is a spot from Strabo, the middle one, this is a vertical wall of um, Baraboo Quartzite. All I've done is I've gone in Skitch, which is the far left, I said, use my camera roll. I've imported this that was taken in Strabo, but is on the camera roll. And then I've just started annotating it. And then of course I did all sorts of things. Um, the three lines, there's a blue line, a yellow line, and then a very thin red line. So that shows you the resolution of this. So there's a lot of tools that are already within Skitch that make for a very professional um, sort of annotation. Different colors, letterings, different color arrows, different thicknesses of lines, that sort of thing. The ability to, to use a keyboard is also very nice. Okay, so to import something back to Strabo after using Skitch, I timed it, it took 15 seconds. You basically just go to your station, you say, okay, it's a sketch or it's a annotated photo, your choice, and you press okay, and then you just go to, you can see it says on the right side, it says camera roll, you just choose the camera roll picture, and then you just hit the import button. And it's that simple. And then it goes into Strabo Spot. So those are, that's a very simple way of using a, an external program to do that. Skitch is not the only one. It's just the one we've sort of defaulted to. All right. The third, the fourth option. Now, um, people have shown you this, but I wanted to make um, a specific point. For any picture you take, you can add a line or a polygon. And here's the trick. If you go to line, you'll see that my line does not look like a line, it looks like a squiggly line. If you press it down and hold it down, you can draw any shape you want. And so I've just drawn a curly Q and I drew it in the air so you could see it. Um, but it can have basically any shape. So you'll wanna use that functionality when you do a line, this is on a map or on a photo, you can hold it down you, this does not work in the desktop, this only works in the field app, but if you hold it down, you'll get a squiggly arrow. And that's all I have to say. Yeah, good, okay, great. So I think folks are kind of starting to see now uh, after being initially exposed to what Casey walked us through yesterday and then Diane showing you how you can start to build and layer the interpretations in. Um, and I will walk through that. Uh, I'll just build on that a little bit more. So an example of a project where you might have multiple sections into it. Um, and I, I guess I just will reiterate, like, 
there has been so many requests for, and we are all in the same spot where we sort of desperately want these um, extra kind of graphical annotations and uh, and bells and whistles added in. And um, I think, you know, Basil is encouraging that we can get there, um, but I think it's, it's awesome that we have this tool to start and we should all keep thinking as a community about how we can build and expand it and what we can build around it to leverage this tool that exists right now. So, um, Okay, now I gotta actually make sure. There you go, it's advancing. All right, so I'm just gonna walk you through, uh, th this This is a project that, um, it's based on a project that Mark, Mark Patskowski and I teach as part of a graduate field stratigraphy course at Penn State. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll walk you through what the project is so you kind of get a sense of what the goals that we have are and, and how we approach it in the field. Um, it should look familiar as either sort of a group teaching project or just a research project where you're collecting multiple sections. Um, I'll talk you through how to set up Strabo to handle such a project, at least how I would do it. Uh, and then I will briefly talk through adding stratigraphic sections, but I think you've probably seen that a few times already. And so we'll touch a little bit more on interpretations and then finish up with some of the ways you can share and export, right? Because of course, at some point, you might get a, uh, you, we might be dissatisfied with how the sections look in Strabo, but it's pretty easy to get them out and clean them up in another program. Um, all right, so let me just introduce you to this project. So the goals just from a, uh, the, the scope of this project would be to do um, stratigraphic architecture analysis uh, and in sort of interpreting sedimentary processes uh, in pretty detail. This is a smaller scale project than a huge field project. Um, from teaching, our goals for this would be to do just uh, build field observation skills, data collection skills. Um, and from a research perspective, the scope of this project would target things like sediment transport reconstruction, reservoir architecture, or sort of specific kind of earth history, paleoclimate sea level reconstructions. Um, so to introduce you just to the area, so we will uh, be visiting the uh, Permian of the Delaware Basin. So you can see on, this is a Strabo map where, uh, map where I have some spots here in the location. So just in West Texas on the border with New Mexico. Um, back in the day, this was, uh, you know, a, a locality on the kind of western side of low latitude Pangaea. Um, if we zoom in a little bit on the paleogeographic reconstruction, you can see we're dealing with a passive margin. So, so this area, uh, you know, is heavily driven by climate um, and sea level changes. So, um, right, so long term, a chronostratigraphic chart here just to orient you, this is sort of middle Permian. Long term, this succession kind of alternates back and forth between being carbonate dominated and clastic dominated, and then this big Capitan Reef system that folks might be familiar with. Um, all the while, there's sort of these interfingering, sort of reciprocal sedimentation packages of clastic and carbonate dominated intervals. Um, what we're focusing on, so in this image here, this is the brushy canyon formation, these siliciclastic deep water deposits of the Delaware Mountain Group. Um, up at the top here is the Capitan limestone. That's part of the Capitan reef system here. So just to kind of give you a sense of what, uh, what large stratigraphic interval we're spanning in this region. Um, but we're going to be focusing in for this project on this brushy canyon deep water siliciclastic deposits. Um, and, and just to provide some context here, the goal, right, is what we do in the field normally, is that we would go out, we might, we might be interested in reconstructing, for example, the local sediment uh, the, the local history of sedimentation. So how in a deep water system, you know, how channelized were the deposits? Were we in sort of a fan-like configuration or a channel-like configuration? And, and what were the changes through time? So we want to aim to sort of reconstruct this local filling history. And of course, the way we do that is we go make detailed descriptions of, of the, the sediments that we're seeing and then do some interpretations from them, right? So the idea is that Strabo Spot is built, all the said functionality is built to collect this data and preserve it in a digital form. Um, yeah, so the scale of this, just for reference that we're going to be talking about, is the, it's a smaller scale than what Diane was talking about. We're going to be focusing on kind of the history of one channel fill. Um, and in this case, uh, what Mark and I do with a class, and also what you might do if you were doing research out here, is you might want to do multiple small sections to interpret more detailed stratigraphic architecture. So just uh, here again in the map in the corner, we're gonna be focusing in on this little patch. For reference, this bench here is this bench in the topo map, and then this is that Capitan limestone formation here, just to orient you. 
this is basically the sand body, this bench itself, salt flat bench, is the sand body we're going to be looking at the architecture of. Um, and here's an image of it in the field. So you can see, you know, it, uh, it, we're talking about maybe 30-ish meters at the most. Um, and we want to characterize the lateral variability across this unit. Okay, so how do we set this up in, in Strabo? And uh, so you can think of this as if you're working in a class, this would be a workflow for setting things up that way. Also as a research group. So for example, my research group, we um, have shared projects uh, that are set up in this way. Okay, so first thing, I just put a note up here. So for teams, so if it's a class or a research group, uh, well, at least the way I, I've been doing this is to have a shared user account. So we have a username and password. We actually set it up with our devices. Um, and, and so we have a shared username and password that we all have access to. So that allows multiple people to contribute to the same project. Um, if you if everyone has individual projects, you're able to share the data, but you can't, it's, it, it's not easy to aggregate it into one project for visualization and sharing. So at the moment, that's what we do. We have one shared user account. So a specific username and password that the whole team has. Um, remember if you're setting up, a, so you would log in through that shared account uh, and you set up a new project, just one more reminder, uh, you use, you click on the, manage project, the little hamburger button, and then once that pops up, you go to the three dots and you can add a new project. Uh, that uh, On the, the web version or the desktop version of Strabo Spot, remember that looks like logging into your account, um, going to my data, and then you'll select this plus button to add a new project. And just a reminder again too, this is the project level information, so kind of high level uh, overview of the project. Um, notice, I know we had a question yesterday about changing the datum. Uh, the datum is listed here, uh, and you can have information. We'll have to get some confirmation about whether or not that does anything to the actual uh, display in the program, but at least it's recorded there. All right, so, uh, so again, we're going to look at a way of, we, we want to be able to collect multiple sections, so have multiple teams working at once, or if you're doing research, maybe several field seasons or different localities that you want to collect together. And so the way we're going to handle that is to actually set up, set up separate data sets for each, um, for each team or each section in this case. Um, so let me go back. I'm just, the next image is going to be zoomed in right down here into the field area. Um, I just want to point out too, these are preloaded reference points. I think we just had a question about that. So these are reference points. Uh, uh, for example, if you scout something out on Google Earth or you have uh, GPS points from a colleague or an old field campaign, um, as, as long as you can convert those into a shape file, you can upload them to Strabo Spot via the, via the web interface and then add them to a project. So I have these reference points here, for example. These are the locations that we want to check out in more detail. Um, I'm just going to zoom in again. So there we are. It's getting a little hard to see with the topography. So just a reminder that we can always switch the, the layers up here. So if we switch over to the satellite view, um, now you can start to see some of the terrain a little better. Uh, I'm going to zoom in so we can see even more clearly. And then one more reminder too that, of course, you can download these for um, offline use. So I'm sitting here at my house and I have a reasonable Wi-Fi connection so I can cruise around, but you can always go up to the three buttons in the corner and save uh, these maps for offline use, which is really handy. Okay, so back to this setup. So now we have this shared project. So this is my team's group account. Um, and what we want to do is under project manage, again, so you've been there before, go back there, and then we're going to get into this data sets interval. And remember again that it always starts out with default, and the data set for new spots is default, but so we want to add some options here. So you click the plus, you enter a name, and section one is what I chose to name this one. Um, the, so so the, the key here that you're going to want to pay attention to is that we want to pay attention to which data sets are active. If the data set isn't active, you won't be able to see the spots housed within that data set on your maps or in your um, queries of spots within, within the program. So as long as that's active, the spots will be populated into the program, that, the, the, in, into your device. The other thing that you want to check is what the data sets is for new spots. It defaults to default, <laughs> uh, but if you, uh, if you want to, you know, make sure your data is going into the right spot, you would click on this and actually change it to section one. 
Um, just, I, I guess I kind of think of data sets as folders. So we're setting up different folders to house different groups of data. Okay, so here's kind of what I set up for this. Here's that, that pre-populated points that we wanted to use as reference points. That's one data set. And then I just made a data set for each section that we plan to measure. Um, so key things again here are you need to turn on or activate the relevant data sets for both to be able to map or add spots to them and also to be able to visualize them. And then you want to ensure that the, the most appropriate, uh, that the appropriate data set is turned on for new spots. Okay, so for example, if I was going to be contributing to section five in that locality, uh, I might wanna, I could turn on these other sections to see what data exists there and where they are. Um, but I do want to make sure that the data set for new spots is section five, because I want all my data to be going only into that folder. Um, and the reason for this, so this is a, a reminder about how we actually connect back to, this, to the database and how we can share through the project management. So here I am, section five, I'm working in section five, I've added 22 spots, now I want to go to upload that. So if I go uh, back to these three buttons, uh, upload that project it will only be section five uploaded. And so what happens, if you guys have practiced this already, you will actually get a warning when you go to upload as a reminder that project properties uh, and everything in section five will be uploaded and will overwrite the project properties. So this is why if we have things separated into different folders, you just wanna be careful or have your students or your team being careful to ensure that uh, they're only uploading the uh, only that the data sets they want to upload, upload and contribute to are active um, to ensure there's no overwriting. Okay, and then you can kind of confirm that the, that the spots are uploaded. Um, another way to confirm, so this is a case where I had updated all five of these spots when I was putting this project together. It's just a nice confirmation window that everything uploaded successfully. And then of course another way to check is just to log into the web account and you can see that um, everything is updated with the appropriate number of spots and features. Okay. So uh, this is a way we can sync projects and, um, and, and all work together in the same master project and have our materials together, but still organized in a way that, that they can be um, separated and worked on independently. All right, so you've seen adding sections um, several times here. And I'm actually, I, I've, I'm not gonna walk you through adding sections in this case. I'm just gonna walk you through the sections that I have put in so you can kind of get a sense of it. And then we'll talk about how you can use some of these. So these are still just screen captures from the mobile app. So here's our little sort of study area again. This section out here, um, this, is, this is what it looks like, pretty fine-grained, interbedded. Um, you can see here, I did make a few notes. So here's one uh, note in this interval, there was a sort of conspicuous layer or interval of really dark carbonaceous material. Um, small scours started to pop up here. And then there was a bedding thickness and color change in the middle of this unit up here. If we step down to the next section from the south, this is what that looks like. Again, you'll notice here, uh, the person that measured this section noticed that there was a uh, dark gray carbonaceous material. Of course, in each one of these spots, if we clicked on C, we would also see the full range of grain sizes, the bedding, contact, and geometry information, all of the other attributes that we would assign uh, to this spot are housed within C. Uh, these uh, spots that we added on the side are more for the kind of annotation purposes in the field, sort of like we've been talking about uh, wanting. <laughs> all right, here's another example. So we've stepped to the next section to the south. Um, here you can see, so we've got some more annotations here. This is a case where we actually uh, measured a paleocurrent. Um, this is accomplished through the orientations tab, which is part of the sort of original structure development, um, but you can actually see that the paleocurrent plots here, which is nice. Uh, here's the next section to the south. Um, I just wanted to point out with this one that, uh, right, so, so we've got these little uh, notes on here. Uh, yeah, okay, so there's bound sequence. Maybe that's not necessarily helpful, but a reminder that you can click on that. And in this case, um, I added an image to show that specifically. And, and this is actually a reasonable view, you know, where if you can open and close these, you can sometimes see, see what you need. So that's a way of quickly accessing some, some visuals that, that would be helpful. Um, finally, in the, uh, the, the last section to the south, you can see we've gotten a lot coarser grain as we've approached this kind of prominent bench here. Um, 
the I uh, this is another it's a hack for the fact that we can't put <laughs> symbols in but th this is a case where there's ripples I wanted a visual reminder um, and this shows up again if you just click on this the same way that this image showed up here uh, these summary boxes are quite handy because they'll display the sketches and images associated with the tab of course, you can always go to see more to see the full details, but that can be a little overwhelming, especially when you're just trying to, to get an overall sense of what the section looks like or, or what the interval looks like. Okay, so just to, just to sort of show you, so here we have section one uh, out here all the way to section five here. And these are just straight up screen dumps uh, just for visualization purposes. And I guess the one thing that I want to say is that this is actually a reasonable visualization of lithologic trends. Um, I, I didn't go in and, and do any editing of the boxes, so they're still really blocky. Um, but at this scale, this is actually still a helpful amount of information that's conveyed pretty quickly visually. Um, you know, and this is this is not too dissimilar to what we might have students do to draft quick sections on paper in the field and uh, during a class exercise and then tape them up on a cross section and start correlating from there. So, so this is a, I, I feel like it's a reasonable first step for a lot of what we might do. Um, let's see, so now, but of course the next step, once we have the data collected and the fundamental observations are there, we want to start interpreting them. And so Diane walked you through um, a little bit of this, and I'm going to show you how uh, I might do it <laughs> in a similar context. So here's that section five again down here, uh, where we've got a few notes on the side. Now, um, again, this is just, just a little quick reminder that what we're going to be doing to add or overlay interpretations is we're going to be using these add spot menus here. Um, and likely we'll be spending most of our time adding um, lines and polygons. And so just a reminder then, if you click and hold, if you're in the mobile app, when you let go, Basil just showed this, but the straight line turns to a squiggly line. And same with the uh, 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 angled polygon turns into a freehand polygon. Note in the uh, desktop or the web version, I think you have to double click on these features to get them to change, but you can do the same thing. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to remind folks about is that edit spot button that we've already used for changing the shapes of some of these, but uh, if you want to move a spot to a new position on the column or you don't like what you drew, that's, that's always a, a good thing to remember. All right, so what I'm going to do in this case is what I want to do is I just want to flag certain intervals as belonging to a certain facies or environmental interpretation. So I'm going to add polygons. I want to add them to the side of the column because I've kind of got all my notes and uh, over here. And so I want to start building my interpretations over here. I know that that might not be the traditional way we do things in a field book or when we were presenting something for publication, but just in terms of kind of keeping track of, uh, of notes in the field and on the fly, that's where I'm going to build them over here. Um, and here are my fantastically drawn polygons. <laughs> in, in this case, um, what I wanted to do is designate, so this group of kind of coarsening upward packages with ripples, um, you know, looking at all the details in here, we want to interpret these as, as channel levy deposits, deep water channel levies. And then up here, we want to interpret these as deep water channel complexes. They have a different suite of, of faces and obser observations, and so uh, that's our interpretation there. And then I also want to note that there's an erosional surface here, so even though this is kind of sand on sand, and broadly these are similar, they're both interpreted as channel complexes, that there is a boundary in there that we want to note. And so like Diane showed, um, so I'm just going to click on this that I called levy, and this is the same thing Diane just showed, but I'll walk you through again because there's uh, a lot of stuff in the interpretation tab to play around with. Right, so moving forward, so once we click on levy, just a note that the set interpretations tab, depending on the real estate and what kind of device you're using, it can be pretty far off to the right, so you might have to scroll over to see it. Um, you know, as we saw before, there's these four main sub-tabs, one for processes, one for environmental interpretations, the surface-associated interpretations, and architecture. So in this case, I just want to click, we see evidence of currents. Uh, specifically, we see evidence of turbidity currents in here. Um, if I move to the environment, I, I know it's a deep water channel environment um, in this case. And specifically, I want to mark this interval as a levy. 
Um, I'm going to skip surfaces for now, but uh, just to show you that if deep water is selected, or the deep water architectural elements here also include levee. So if I wanted to uh, refer to things that way. Um, the other important point I want to make here is that although these won't display directly on the stratigraphic column, these are important keywords, and Diane emphasized this as well, is that these are things that are built into the Strabo said vocabulary. So they're built into the database. So they're gonna be nicely queryable um, down the road. So, so that's another reason to try to flag some of these specifically. Um, uh, the only other thing, let me just go back just to show you this as a reminder, I added all of that information only to this spot. So this spot right now, contains only interpretation information. It doesn't actually contain any of the lithologic information. You could, of course, add interpretations to any of these um, boxes. So, so there's a lot of flexibility, and I think that we all collectively can develop uh, workflows that, that work for different purposes. For me, I decided I wanted interpretation spots separate because I, I, I wanted to be able to, to sort of handle the data separately now the reality is because we know where this spot sits uh, in, in the stratigraphic section map view space, we know that it's at the same, or, or we could, we could uh, the, the coordinates of this interpretation spot that I made are gonna overlap with the coordinates of these interval spots that do contain all the, the fundamental observations that that interpretation was derived from. So that's how I separated it, uh, but of course it, it, it a lot of folks might prefer to build the interpretations right into the spots. Um, let me, all right, so just wanna to get to sharing and collaborating. Um, okay, so there's several different ways of kind of sharing and, and using the data. Like I said, I set up this project specifically so we could share the project itself, so we could all have our data in the same project. Um, but when it comes to sharing with uh, uh, other people and, and also sh you know, sharing with our colleagues, uh, you know, it's good to walk through a couple different ways. So one way is to share directly via Strabospot, the program itself. Um, and so remember when you go to upload, so here we were with our current project, you know, we clicked on the three dots, we went to upload the project, right now section five is active, so that was gonna upload and overprint any new activity directly to the kind of the database. Um, that, that as soon as we do that, everything can be synced, right? So separate data sets can be synced in the same project under these shared user accounts. In order to share that project with others, and this is what you're gonna do for, for our sharing on Friday, is when you build your sections, uh, once you're ready, you're gonna convert that to public. So that's just switching this little toggle here. Um, and then once it's public, it will be visible in the Strabo search that Casey showed or will show. Uh, <laughs> um, so you navigate to the search, which is over here on the Strabo website, and you'll get a map interface. There we go. Um, you can actually see there's my salt flat bench example down here. So I'm just going to zoom in down there. I've changed the background because I sure like the satellite photos. Uh, and then this little button here is going to create a link for me and that link will basically uh, navigate any user to this uh, part of this the Strabo database and um, if, if, if I were live right now I can click on these and actually start to navigate and see the data and information that's contained in these spots. All right so that I click on that link button this is the link I get so you can highlight that and copy it and this is how you will share uh, your project with us for, for review on Friday. Okay, so that's, a, that's just a nice way of sharing. It gets people directly into the database um, and can interact with your data in a very similar way that, that you would uh, in the program itself. Uh, now for downloading, a um, couple of options here. So on, you know, this is in the My Projects. Uh, so if you go to download and under the select, these are the options that you get. Um, I just wanna point out too that this does not need to be public for the download. So, so for you to, for you to download a field book or strat sections or an XLS or anything. It does not need to be public. That's uh, that's It's always available to you. But the big one that I think most of us are going to uh, use is the strat sections. Um, what that does is it creates a, a vector graphic file, so an SVG, that's downloadable and then it's something that you can edit in a program like Illustrator or Inkscape. Um, so here's what that looks like if I clicked on section five. If I click on that download, 
it's going to open up a new browser window um, for me. When, look, look at my, like, those are such clean little boxes there, aren't they? <laughs> so it's going to open up uh, the, the graphical representation of this image so I can view it right in the browser. Um, or I can right click on that link and save it as, and then I get, uh, then I can download it. Just a note, I've noticed on my Mac, I don't know if other folks have noticed it, that, that I do need to actually type in .svg for it to be uh, uh, readable in other programs. Um, it won't automatically recognize it if I don't do that. So, but it's a quick fix. So then you save that. Um, and then here's an example of it just opened up raw in Illustrator. So I just took that SVG, I dumped it right into Illustrator, and this is what it looks like. I just want to point out that, uh, that first of all, this is a pretty good place to be starting from, right? Rather than coming back from the field with just your thicknesses and descriptions and having to draft each column. Now you have the full capabilities of Illustrator to design and model this section any way you want. The other thing is because it's all uh, vector editable and comes in in layers, I was quickly, I, I, don't, I don't like, you know, you can't even see the labels on here, but I, within a minute, quickly hopped through this and um, just turned off the white outlines, and then you can already start to see things better. So, so this is, I think, a workflow that most of us are going to use, certainly for sort of publishing or sharing detailed um, or more formal communication. This is an option I think that most of us are going to use. Uh, one other thing that I just want to point out um, is, is that another download option that I really like is the KMZ uh, option. So this is a super great way to share things via Google Earth. You can send it to a colleague and they can interact with your full data set through Google Earth. So this is just an example. I know this, look, this is in Death Valley from a field trip I ran in the spring and I know it looks like a mess, but each one of these spots is like a, a, a data set or an observation that, that, uh, that that we took out in the field and there's different data sets for different days and it was very easy to just export all of that Strabo data. This also includes all the photographs that we took that were added to the spots um, and any of those other attributes are viewable by clicking on this. So I guess uh, I will stop there. I just wanted to emphasize that you know Strabo does have options for multi-user um, or multi-season you know project management if you're sort of building on things. And, and then I think the other thing I just want to emphasize is like what Strabo does right now is, is it opens up the door for us to do really cool stuff. We have, the, we have the possibility now of collecting this data in a digital form. And now the exciting part is developing new tools and new workflows for spitting this out into some of the more advanced kind of graphics or uh, um, analytical approaches that we want to take as a community.